up for participating in the auction coming up uh, at Southern North Sea 2. It actually started a couple of years before the, the government started the formal process of opening the areas. It started off with an idea of, of uh, we, we thought we could construct uh, offshore wind in Norway without subsidies under certain conditions. So, so we actually had meetings with the ministry uh, very early on introducing the hybrid model that we we believe it would uh, would uh, work uh, for a subsidy free uh, environment. Um, uh, as we all know, the the phase one will not include an, an, an hybrid, but uh, I think that will enforce itself through uh, uh, in the next uh, rounds to be opened up. Um, from our side, um, we in addition to develop a project that could be subsidy free. We also wanted to uh, create an environment for Norwegian supply chain, um, and we have we uh, decided very early on our own strategy on on how to do that, uh, and that's maybe a little different from what, what what's normal procedure. Uh, but we actually started with the supply chain. Um, we um, we started very early in discussions with Aqua Solutions, and and the reason for that is to build. Um, foundations in Norway, there's not very many who, who can who ha have the capabilities and capacities to do so. So early on, we were happy to to include Arca Solutions in, as a supplier uh, in the consortium, and then started building that with other strong companies. Uh, we have NOV National Oil Valley in uh, in uh, located in Kristiansand. It's a huge company, thirty thousand people uh, employed. With, with a lot of solutions uh, for both uh, during installation and operation and maintenance. We have Seafront and Pentagon Group. Uh, they are massive in, um, in logistics. Logistics is a, is a big part of offshore wind and have a, a, a strategy on logistics from day one is, is very important. Uh, then we had um, the what's happening in Egasun, we thought was very interesting, especially uh, from my point of view, uh, I'm uh, born and raised in a, in a municipality called Ranabag, north of uh, of uh, Stavanger, where I follow the development of the uh, oil and gas um, um, uh, bases, the Dusavik base and the Tananga base, how they develop from very simple uh, services into very advanced environments for, for, for oil and gas supply chain. And they're doing exactly the same in, in Egasun, and we were extremely happy to include those in the consortium. And then we have OSM and Marine, who is dealing with the the uh, the ship management, uh, also a big part of this. And at least, but uh, but uh, but still a very important player is, is Hitachi, um, a world leader in HVDC uh, and and also uh, collector systems for for offshore wind. Um, so, in addition to the, the suppliers themselves, we strengthened the team with Greenstat in Bergen, uh, responsible for the hydrogen solutions into the system. We're currently developing a, a hydrogen strategy uh, for the project uh, uh, with, with multiple uh, aims. Uh, here, we're, we're envisioning a stepwise approach to the hy hydrogen uh, part of it. Um, then we were uh, uh, very lucky to include uh, Asku von Ibar and Norgesgruppen. Norgesgruppen is an extremely exciting co company. Uh, as the, uh, many of you might know, they're one of the big uh, players in, in, the, in, in, um, in retail, on, in food, food retail. Um, and they're very ambition, ambitious on, on climate uh, cuts. Uh, they need about a terawatt hour of power within 2030 to totally decarbonize their supply chain. Um, and that's their main reason for participating in, in the consortium. So, so they will actually be a part owner and use the power themselves. And then the last piece in the puzzle that we thought were, was very imp uh, important was ENBW. We were looking very specifically to find a major European offshore wind player um, and preferably a German one. So ENBW was on top of our list. 
Uh, they're a huge company. Um, I think they're about 25,000 uh, people employed. They're Germany's third largest um, uh, energy company. They're into nuclear, coal, gas, um, uh, renewables, onshore, and also coming up as one of the major renewable players in offshore wind in, in, in Europe. So, and they have defined their whole market for Europe. Um, and what they can really offer to the Norwegian supply chain in general and, and the, the consortium members specifically is an early gateway to the European market. I'll, I'll come back to why we believe uh, that is, is possible. So, so instead of having an approach that if, if you get an, an area awarded for development, you run it out on, on, an, uh, on tender process. We more have selected a strategy where we want to gather the key uh, components in, uh, in an, both construction and an O&M phase uh, and basically sit around the table and ask ourselves, how are we going to crack this code? Uh, and that's, that's a different approach uh, to, to this. And we, we, uh, we think this is quite an, uh, an exciting approach. Um, let's see. There we go. So our aim is a 35 billion private project in the Southern North Sea 2. And the reason, uh, original reason for it was that we were not rigged for a subsidy play. We were rigged for a subsidy free play. And the only location where you can get close to subsidy free play uh, we considered was uh, Southern North Sea 2 with a hybrid model. But the project is, is big and we have an ambition uh, that at least 50% should go to the Norwegian supply chain. That's a massive challenge uh, given the constraints in, in the supply chain we see. But in addition to the construction costs, there's also an eight, six to 800 million kroner yearly O&M budget. And if you look at the Norwegian oil and gas supply chain, they're very much focused towards the O&M in uh, in the oil and gas uh, and and we believe that's a very important market as well that needs to develop uh, but i'd like to to start when talking about the big picture it was interesting to follow the the political debate under the the, the former government because their ambition and they were very vocal about it was that they didn't believe they needed the power from offshore wind uh, it was a pure supply chain driven, driven effort. Um, and we couldn't quite understand that view because when you start looking at, um, at the power needs and where the, where, where the power go, you, you find some quite interesting uh, things here. So it, Norway needs to uh, to meet two major uh, challenges in the years to come. Number one is decarbonization, and the se but the second one is what we call reindustrialization, because Norway has about 160,000 jobs in the oil and gas sector that will sooner or later, and I don't know, and I guess nobody really knows when that is going to end, but it will end one day. Um, and that in the oil and gas sector, an average turnover per employee is up to 16, between 13 and 16 million crowners a year. It's a huge turnover. The next on the list is actually lawyers that have a turnover of around 3 million a year. So not only do we need to replace uh, jobs, but we need to replace the revenues they generate to be able to sustain the level uh, of, of living we have in Norway. Uh, just an anecdote, the Norwegian national budget is the same size as the Swedish and it's three times the size, size of the Finnish and the Finns are, this, are the same population as Norway and that's the reason. But if you go into uh, and look at, at the decarbonization, that's basically electrification, sorry. Um, and you have direct electrification and you have indirect electrification. And if you look at, at um, where offshore wind comes into play, it, it comes into play basically on the direct electrification where the price elasticity is, is much higher 
than in indirect electrification where you need to, to build biofuels. So in let's say uh, so any any decarbonization that involves direct electrification has the potential for using offshore wind for due to costs. Um, but it's also important to, to, to bear in mind that there's quite a lot of power consumption in Norway where you would need cheaper energy, renewable energy sources than you can, can have from, from offshore wind. And that is uh, in indirect uh, electrification and also in the, in the Norwegian industrialization that, that is to come. It's about somewhere between 15 and 30 euro per kilowatt hour. The, the re-industrialization would need depending on, on, on the industries. So when we're discussing the energy need in Norway, we need to bear in mind both the uh, vo volume, uh, power price mix and timing come into play. Uh, if you look at um, uh, the, the power need in the years to come, all analysis I've seen, I couldn't figure out. Because when you listen, and, and especially what that was last fall when I attended the, the uh, NVE Energy Days, where Startnet presented, first they did present a, 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 an overview over all the industry that had, had applied for interconnection. And we're talking about in total more than 20,000 megawatts. That equals around 180 terawatt hours a year. Three slides later, they, they, their projections for 2050 was about 220 terawatt hours a year. And that just didn't add up. And when you when you start look at the power need and, and, and split that into a power need from uh, 2030 and 2050, we see that we need an additional 80 terawatt hours a year in addition to we produce today by 2030 and 180 terawatt hours a year by 2050. And when you look at where the, this power can come from, we have energy efficiency, uh, very ambitious goals in 2030 and 2050, extremely hard to reach. Just bearing in mind that the city of Oslo is consuming about nine terawatt hours. So energy efficiency by 2030, more than the, the whole city of Oslo, I think that's going to be hard to, to, to reach, but uh, well, let's put it in there. Sun power, uh, also quite ambitious uh, estimates. Uh, I, would, I would just like to, to give you an example of sun power. Norgesgruppen has about 100,000 square meters of sun uh, panels on their rooftops. The, those 100,000 square meters combined produce a little less than one of the wind turbines onshore. So it, it's a massive challenge. Hydropower, uh, I've seen numbers, but if you go up to 20 terawatt hours, then you basically are going to build out the, the, the last uh, protected um, waterfalls in Norway to reach that number. Uh, offshore wind uh, needs to pay, take a big part of this. But it's not going to come before 2030. That's impossible. It will come after 2030. So you see, to to to, to basically to uh, if we are going to make a strategy where we're going to succeed in in our decarbonization and succeed in our reindustrialization, we will need in Norway about uh, 80 terawatt hours, about 20 gigawatt of offshore wind to get there, in addition to onshore wind and other energy sources. And, and I think that view has never, um, uh, uh, has never um, uh, been openly debated among the Norwegian uh, politics. You see a li little change in that discussion with the new government, but the former government never saw that picture. And it's a big challenge for the industry because we know that this industry will need quite a lot of subsidies. Um, and if you're going to use tens of billions of crowners to subsidy this industry to get it going in Norway, and you believe that you don't need the products that this is going to produce, I don't think we're going to succeed with the industry. So we need to build the rationale for we actually need the power. And then, of course, the government's new target of 30 gigawatts then 10 gigawatts can, can of course go uh, overseas.
but we need to have a focus on the 20 gigawatts that we actually need ourselves. Um, so if you look again at along the Norwegian coast, what you see on the left hand side is NVE's study, I think it was back in 2012, um, where they identified 15 areas that could be suitable for uh, offshore wind. Uh, they're going to do a new study now, but there, I, I don't think at least that this picture is going to change very much. Uh, but if it does not change, you see that it's the only only two areas where you can actually interconnect to Europe uh, is, is Southern North Sea 2 and Southern North Sea 1. The rest of them will be too far away and, and it's going to be uh, more or less impossible to, in an economic way to build a, a, uh, uh, an offshore infrastructure, uh, bringing that power down to market. Uh, in addition to that, there's an, a second challenge that is not very much debated, and that's the landing points. Uh, today, if you're gonna, if you're gonna interconnect uh, thousands of megawatts into the UK sector, you have to go 200 kilometers on, uh, on land to find an interconnection point that has capacity. So, and with the ambitions that uh, Europe has for offshore wind, uh, the onshore grid capacity is going to be a constraint in itself. And that's why we believe that it's going to be uh, very difficult to impossible to envision Norwegian offshore wind projects interconnected directly to shore. And we believe it's a more uh, feasible way uh, to uh, build a strategy where you interconnect them to other offshore wind farms in the North Sea that are already has interconnect or have interconnectors to shore with grid capacity. That would, of course, put constraints on when and how much power you can export uh, at, at any given time, but you will have a much more integrated and, and efficient power system because you're going to utilize the cables more or less 100% all the time. So you, you, your, 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 your uh, payback will be much better. Um, another perspective that's interesting in my view is look at the, 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 the market itself. Given that the Norwegian offshore wind market is not going to materialize until after 2030, it's our view that the Norwegian supply chain must define the North Sea as their home market, not Norway. If you're going to wait for Norway, the, the, the European supply chain, that is a 20 year old supply chain already, they will develop further and it's going to be tougher and tougher to, to, um, to compete in, the, in that market. Uh, and if we do not succeed in building an, a competitive Norwegian supply chain fast, then the, the, the 30 gigawatts in Norway could very well be constructed more or less by, by European players and not Norwegian. So we need to, in our view, we need to do this in a smart way uh, to be able to reach our supply chain goals. If you look at the market itself, the, the, the prognosis I've seen at least is of the 450 gigawatt uh, 2050 market, about 10 to 15 percent would be floaters. The rest would be bottom fixed. That means, that in our view, that you need to succeed in bottom fixed to succeed with floaters. Again, the reason for it is not, is not that to, to construct a floater is not very complicated. The challenge with floaters is cost. So you basically need to, to, to uh, make mass production facilities where you can, you can get down the cost per kilogram steel or ton steel produced. It's interesting to see that the cheapest uh, produced steel in the world is produced in Germany. That's monopiles because they have just streamlined the production of monopiles and can put, produce it cheap, uh, cheaper than, um, than uh, China, for example. So in our view, Southern North Sea is extremely important also to succeed with Utsia North and other areas. Um, and then we come to the next steps. 
we were argued for long that if 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 we're going to be competitive in the international market, we need to open up areas fast. Um, now I've seen in in the news that the government is envisioning to uh, they, they have finalized the auctions by uh, the fall of 2023. Then we've lost another year. That's that's uh, that's not good. Another thing that's quite important is that if you're going to succeed with maximum Norwegian content, you need annual announcements and area awards, not like three or four or five massive by the 30 gigawatts. The government has uh, 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 has, has said that the next auction will come in 2025 is going to be a big one. The problem then is that the supply chain hasn't had a chance to adapt to the volumes. And then you run a risk again that it's the European supply chain that has the capacity to build that actually will take a larger part of 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 uh, the, the construction of this big, simply because of supply chain constraints in Norway. So uh, to be able to succeed with Norwegian supply chain is not only to get started fast, but it's also a yearly uh, with smaller chunks opening of areas to build that so you can build that supply chain organically. Very important in in in, uh, in my uh, in in our view. And then the third uh, point that we think uh, think is important is the um, uh, is also to succeed in in constructing and not only auction. The biggest challenge to bring the 30 gigawatts online will be onshore grid. Uh, and that takes a long time to reinforce the onshore grid to be able to 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 receive at least 20 gigawatts, which we believe is going to be important. Norway will need and what whatever amounts that's going to go overseas. That takes years and years, both to plan, consent uh, and construct. So it's in our view very important that the government actually as soon as possible identifies where the 30 gigawatts are going to be located and where it's going to be interconnected so that Startnet can start the work with uh, with reinforcements. Otherwise, we, we will run a risk that we will be successful in auction the areas, but we will not be successful in constructing the areas. And that was not the, 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 the intent in the first place. And then the last, the last, our last bullet point on the auction itself, uh, we believe that the auction should be a combination of qualitative and quantitative. Also on Southern North Sea too, they're developing a qualitative auction system for Eastern North that could also be adapted partly uh, to Southern North Sea too, because it's not only the cheapest power that's important. That has to be uh, very important, of course. But it's also the social economics around this that's very important. Um, and the last point we want to make is that there's a lot of different consortiums out there uh, competing for both areas now. And you see the same companies in different consortiums in, um, in both areas. Our view is that one company can only um, be awarded one area independent of which consortium they're participating in and more or less like the same rules that you have in the UK. Um, and that that's important uh, out of divers diversification uh, of the players ensuring a broader spectrum of the supply chain in, in the construction of the first phase. Thank you very much. I hope I, I kept my time.